In a land where people are only worshipping false gods, and seemingly no one who follows Jesus, one man has been chosen to set an example for others to follow, in order to help them worship the one true God. The man's name? Christian. Christian, he must follow the Ten Commandments. Christian, he serves a man wearing a garment. Christian, he was chosen to be Jesus' servant. Christian, he must follow the Ten Commandments. Christian, he serves a man wearing a garment. Christian, he was chosen to be Jesus' servant. Now, Christian, he failed to be faithful to him in the land of Skyrim now further back in time but still in Tamriel he's destined for a land named Cyrodiil Christian he must follow the Ten Commandments Christian he serves a man wearing a garment Christian he was chosen to be Jesus' son It seems like you guys can't get enough of this series, so we're back again with another entry. You should get the idea by this point, so let's just get straight into it. The commandments we need to abide by are as follows. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, thou shalt not murder. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. And number 10, you shall not covet. I'm now going to translate these into some rules we need to follow, which will have the main rules that are mandatory for the challenge to be successful and bonus rules that are optional. Some of the commandments are missing because they are impossible to break and will be successfully followed in this challenge no matter what we do. Rule number one is don't be deliberately positively affected by anything linked to a false god. This means that we can't use things like magic, as magic was made by false gods. Now for rule number two, I've thought very hard about what we're going to do in order to abide by the Sabbath day commandment. Originally, I made the Sabbath day on a Sunday, and many of you in the comments said that that was the wrong day and that the Sabbath day was actually Saturday. So in a in another video, I made the Sabbath day Saturday, and then many of you said that Saturday was wrong and the Sabbath day has been updated to Sunday. I'm sure one of you is right or wrong, and I'll let you guys decide that amongst yourselves. But I decided it's better to please none of you than just one of you. So rule number two is to rest for 24 hours on a Tuesday. Moving on from that, we have rule number three, which is to not say anything that dishonors your father or mother. Rule number four is don't murder. Rule number five is don't sleep with a married person. Rule number six is don't steal by the game's logic, which means that if the game considers something to be stealing, we're going to go off that logic alone to consider something to be stealing. And lastly, rule number seven is don't lie. Now it's time to move on to the bonus rules. Rule number one is don't be positively affected by anything linked to a false god, even if it's accidental. This means that even in scenarios where we didn't consciously choose to be affected this way, still counts as breaking this rule. The next bonus rule is don't kill. Now I know many of you don't like the fact that I've limited myself to killing, even though the actual translation says murder, but I feel like every attempt of this challenge would be easy otherwise. At the end of the day, even if it is a mistranslation, I don't want to give anyone any reason for thinking that we're going soft on this challenge. And just to go the extra mile, I'm going to apply this rule to not just humans, but animals and even the undead. Even if logically speaking, the undead shouldn't be considered alive, for all we know those skeletons might have their own thoughts and feelings, and they're just as valuable as us humans. So who are we to say that their life has no value? The next bonus rule is to not steal according to real life logic. This means that if something was considered stealing in a real life scenario, even if the game didn't consider it stealing, this means that this rule would be breached. The next rule is to beat the game on the highest difficulty, and the last rule is to not use non-quest related followers. This means that if someone is following us as part of a quest, 
then we're allowed to use them to assist us, like getting them to kill enemies for us. But we're not allowed to go out of our way to recruit someone to follow us if we can possibly avoid it. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's do this thing! We start our adventure by, as is tradition, naming our character Christian, and then choosing the Imperial class. We get called human trash by a godless heathen. Then we talk to Uriel Septon, who says the whole thing about us being in his dreams. Perhaps the gods have placed you here so that we may meet. Uh, it's God, singular. Thank you very much. We're not having any of that plural crap. We then follow him and the others. We get ordered to do what we have become very skilled at doing already. Keeping quiet and staying out of the way. They leave, and some rats come to attack us. I can't kill them, and need to figure out how to escape the room while they are killing me. The first conundrum we come into is that we have to steal a lockpick to open a door. Now, often I don't loot stuff in the world if I could otherwise avoid it, since it seems like a grey area as to whether or not it is stealing. However, in this case, we have no choice but to take the lockpick. So we already have to address this conundrum. When determining if something is theft when it comes to cases like looting off the ground or looting a dead body, under real life law, you generally have to make appropriate steps to find the owner. This means that I should consider it stealing if I cannot reasonably assume that the property is abandoned. We will analyze this on a case by case basis whenever we have to resort to looting something. In this case, the owner is already dead and with all of their flesh being gone, it is reasonable to assume that no one entitled to the property has made any recent attempts to retrieve it. We can therefore make a reasonable judgement that the property has been abandoned and we are free to loot it. So I take everything. Due to being on the hardest difficulty, I have taken a lot of damage. Unfortunately, I cannot heal myself using spells. So I try to make a run for my life, but unfortunately get screwed over by a rat that's blocking a narrow tunnel. But that was also kind of my fault because I forgot what the jump button was. I eventually enter the next part of the caverns. I follow the tutorial to sneak past the goblin. I then run past some more goblins, but run into a problem where there is a goblin with a bow and arrow that always hits me. There's luckily a trap that I can trigger that will kill them. However, I am hesitant to do this. In Skyrim, I would let my enemies run into traps. But in this case, I have to trigger the trap. Meaning I have to take direct action that leads to someone's death. So I don't want to do this if I can avoid it, because it would be strongly argued to be killing. However, no matter what I do, the goblin hits me every time. It would be better for me to load an older save and try to reach this section with a larger amount of health, but this might not be enough considering there will be many more goblins with bows and our health is in limited supply. In the end, I discover that this game seems to have a similar system to Fallout New Vegas, where if I save after moving a certain amount, then reload that save, the game has a bit of a grace period to prevent me from dying instantly. I use this trick, and the goblin thankfully misses his shot, allowing me to run onwards unscathed. We use the same trick to get past a goblin that shoots lightning, although they seemed to be less precise with their shots anyway. We then find the soldiers and the king again. We see them get attacked, but just watch as they deal with the enemies. I then discover some hidden dialogue that occurs if they haven't spotted me yet, and ends up just going into an endless loop of one of the soldiers begging the Emperor to leave, and the Emperor insisting on resting. Sire, we have to go now. Not yet. Let me rest a moment longer. Please, Sire. We can't stay here. We have to go. Not yet. Let me rest a moment longer. Your Majesty, we need to keep moving. Not yet. Let me rest a moment longer. Not yet. Let me rest a moment longer. Let me rest a moment longer. Let me rest a moment longer. Please, sire. Let me rest. We have a bit of a conundrum when he asks me if I know about the Nine Divines. I have the following three options. I can say they guide us and protect us. I can say I'm not on good terms with them. Or I can say that I don't know and I don't think about it. This is very difficult. With the first option, we are breaking commandment number one. If we pick the third option, we are breaking commandment number nine, since we are lying. Saying that we don't know is one thing, but because we're saying we don't think about it, that means we are lying because it would mean that we don't think about a higher power at all, which is false. In the end, I come to the conclusion that the second option is just about acceptable. You could argue that by acknowledging the gods exist, you are committing a heresy. However, the Bible repeatedly refers to false gods. It is therefore possible to talk about gods without actually acknowledging that they exist. So we choose the second option. We are now forced to pick a sign that will give us benefits. And it is here that we break bonus rule number one, which is where we don't be positively affected by anything linked to a false god, even if it's accidental. 
In this case, we are stating to be born under this sign, so therefore we did not have any free will in accepting this benefit. This means that it only breaks the bonus rule, and not the main rule, where we can't be benefited by consciously choosing it. This challenge is therefore still alive, but we are not off to a good start. Nonetheless, we can at least pick the one that sounds the most biblical, which is the Lord. We then follow the Emperor, and let him and his guards do the killing. At some point, there are finally no enemies nearby, and I can wait one hour to get my health back. That health boost was just what I needed in order to survive the next encounter where the Emperor dies. As an enemy assassin kills him, and then becomes locked onto me. I barely survive with the one guard left alive killing him, and then I wait an hour to have my health restored. We then get to pick our own class. I decide to make a custom class where I pick Stealth, then Agility, and Speed. Then for my major skills, I pick Acrobatics, Armorer, Athletics, Light Armor, Mercantile, Sneak, and Block. I decide to call my class Christian as well, since that's not confusing at all. It then has the nerve to ask us the question, are you sure you want to be a Christian? It's almost as if the devil himself is trying to deter us from taking this path. We obviously click yes. We get given the key to enter the sewers. We only find two rats in our way this time, and I manage to easily escape and make my way to the outside world. I make my way to Wayne and Priory to meet Joffrey. I encountered an enemy a few times on the way, but they proved to be no trouble for us as I managed to easily outrun them. We give the Amulet of Kings to Joffrey. We are tasked to find a man named Martin, the illegitimate son of Uriel Septim, as he is the only heir left for the throne. On the way, I end up almost dying from full damage while running away from wolves, and then get killed by a sorcerer. After travelling through a path that I don't think the game intended me to take, I end up running past the Gate of Oblivion and going straight to the building where Martin is. I speak to him, and he says he is doubting the gods, and that if there is a plan, he doesn't want any part of it. I respond by saying, there is a plan, we're part of it, with him being unaware that we're actually referring to the plan made for us by the Christian god. He chooses to believe us when I say that he's the king's son, but refuses to help us until I help the rest of the people in the chapel escape. By this point, Monday is almost over, so I wait a few hours, then rest in a bed on the floor for 24 hours to honour the Sabbath day known as Tuesday. We then leave the chapel and... <coughs> we then leave the chapel and talk to... Savlian. Just a fair warning, guys. In my Fallout New Vegas run, I butchered a lot of names, and I'm probably going to do the same in this run, so you might want to prepare yourselves, because I'm not going to apologize for it. We tell him that we can help, and he gives us the quest to shut the gate. We head to the Oblivion Gate and go in. After entering the gate, I find that there are three enemies that are taking on one guard. In order to get through this with less trouble, I felt like it was important to have him follow me and my hunch turns out to be correct, as he ends up being essential later where the challenge would have otherwise been impossible without him. After many reload attempts, I finally managed to get one attempt where he successfully takes on all three of the enemies. This was after I managed to distract most of the fire from the enemies, so only one was attacking him at a time. When he says that he's getting out of here, I say that I need his help, and he agrees. Many of you argued in my Skyrim video that by getting someone to follow me and do all of the killing, even though technically I'm not killing anyone, it is just as bad. This is a valid point, and to that I respond with, Get lost, poo face. I'm going to beat this challenge with whatever technicalities I can use. We make our way to the tower, and whenever the soldier takes out an enemy, I rest for an hour so his health goes back to full. When we reach the gate of the tower, we run into a problem where we can't rest before going in because there are enemies nearby. When I tried running back the way we came, he would keep running towards enemies that were on alternate paths. In the end, I told him to wait by the entrance. The game was being stupid, and I ended up having to run all the way back to the Oblivion Gate before it would let me wait. I wait an hour, but come back to find that he was killed by a nearby enemy. I end up loading an older save and try my luck with the tower. We enter, and there are already two enemies inside. But after sneaking into the next room by myself after telling the guard to wait, I find that I can wait and heal. The problem is that the guard doesn't heal with me. I'm guessing he either has to follow me, or be in the same room as me. Another problem is if I try to sneak into the room with him, he gets alerted to the other enemies, which means that I travel to the next room without him. I then manage to get him stuck in an inconvenient spot and run to the door before he can get close to the enemies, and he travels through with me. But since I alert the enemies, this leads to us getting attacked and unable to heal. Eventually, I have one attempt where I get him stuck in an inconvenient spot and sneak over to the door. As I am reaching the door, I hear the sound of him drawing his sword and ready to attack, but luckily I go through the door and hear the sound of him sheathing his sword, and I see that he made it into the other room with me. With the enemies not being alerted to us, I am able to wait and heal us both. I continue the strategy until we reach a room where there is a captive prisoner, and the soldier kills the keeper that's there. 
and I am forced to loot his body for the Sigil Keep Key. This means that the soldier is the only thing allowing us to complete this quest, as he kills on our behalf, which prevents us from breaking rule number two. It would have arguably been murder too, since we came to him, he didn't come to us, so we couldn't argue self-defense. Despite us being spared of this, we now have another problem where looting the body comes in. Since this property belongs to the enemy, and he had to be killed to get it, by taking the key, I am guilty of stealing according to real life rules. Now some of you might find some way to justify this as okay in the comments, but unfortunately, I have to consider this a breach of bonus rule number three, and I have no other alternative but to take the key, because as far as I know, there is no way to continue the main story otherwise. We make our way to the area where we have to close the gate. Again, we have to do a mix of me luring the enemies and him killing them with just enough health to spare, then running to a safe area we can both heal, then rinse and repeat. Unfortunately, I found that both the enemy and friendly NPCs were a little on the stupid side. When we reach the final room, I find that there are way too many enemies in one area for him to take on. And since I came this far with the soldier, I thought I might as well try and save him, even if I don't need him anymore. In the end, after a few attempts, I managed to rush straight to the sigil stone and grab it. I then jumped about, avoiding any damage possible, and I ended up being transported to Kavach with a tiny bit of health to spare. After leaving the gate, I found that the soldier following me also survived. I talked to Savlian, and he asks me to accompany him as they take over the city. I agree, and I draw the fire of the enemies and bait them into attacking me to minimize the amount of damage they do to the soldiers while the soldiers kill them. We enter the chapel, and everyone safely evacuates. We're asked to join Savlian in taking over the castle. This is optional, and not part of the main quest. We aren't given the option to respond, but we never say yes, so we're able to leave without committing a lie. I speak to Martin, and he agrees to come with me to Wayne and Priory. We arrive to find the place attacked. I run from some enemies to find Joffrey in the tower, and since we're in such a small area, I can't easily run around and avoid getting killed. So I immediately go into sneak mode the moment I enter, and let the two enemies attack Joffrey, to which he successfully beats them both. We then go to where the Amulet of Kings is hidden, and discover that it's been taken. Joffrey then tells me to get Martin safely to Cloud Ruler Temple. I get gifted a horse that becomes my property, then start travelling by horseback, get sick of riding the horse, and parkour the rest of the way. I arrive, but they don't arrive with me, so I have to fast travel away, then back to Cloud Ruler Temple for them to arrive with me. The Blades accept Martin to be their future Emperor. I am then tasked to get the Amulet of Kings. I speak to Joffrey, and he asks me to join the Blades. Since I won't do any quests for them, I turn the offer down. He then tells me to contact Boris in order to make a start when it comes to finding the Amulet. I go to meet him, but he is currently being watched. He tells me to sit down, and then when he leaves, follow the guy that tries to follow him. Boris gets attacked, but I just watch, and Boris manages to deal with him just fine. Unfortunately, I am forced once again to steal according to real life rules, since I have to take the book on the mythic dawn from his corpse and present it to Boris. He tells me to present it to Tarmina at the Arcane University. She tells me the book is in four volumes. She gives me the second volume, so I now have two, and directs me to a bookstore named Fintius to get volume three. I ask him for the book, to which he says that someone else has already reserved it. I use persuasion to improve my relationship with him, but unfortunately I need his disposition to go up to 80 in order to get him to sell me the book, and I can only go up to 55 until I resort to bribery. Couple that with the fact that I don't even have the money to buy the book with, even if I could persuade him. Luckily, I am able to confront the buyer of the book after he purchases it. We argue, but eventually he agrees to give me the book after I tell him they killed the Emperor. He then informs me I can meet someone called The Sponsor, where he was initially planning to become a member of the Mythic Dawn. He also tells me that I need to get the fourth book given to me by a member, so I have to meet this sponsor in order to get it. I return to Boris and bring him up to speed. We then follow him to the sewers. I let him take care of any enemies we encounter on the way. At one point, there was a really bizarre interaction where he walks up to an enemy crab but stares at it for a solid 30 seconds before realizing it's actually an enemy and killing it. I later end up waiting in order to heal us both, only to find that he's run ahead and left me behind, so I have to run past some enemies to catch up, which I do without too much trouble. We now reach the section where we meet up with the Mythic Dawn, and we have a challenge ahead of us. It is possible for Boris to die here. Trying to save his life is inherently the right thing to do, but we also need him to kill at least one Mythic Dawn member, so I can take the fourth volume of the book off their corpse. We've already broken the bonus rule when it comes to stealing, but if I had to resort to pickpocketing, it means that I'd also be stealing by the game's own logic. Either way, 
Keeping Boris alive long enough to take the book is necessary. Preventing his death altogether would be a nice bonus. In my first attempt, I choose to say that I'll cover him. This does not work out, and I found that only on one of the attempts, he managed to barely kill the guy that had the book, and he died at the same time. I grabbed the book, but died straight after. Every other attempt, he died before killing even one. When I choose to be the one that attends the meeting instead, Boris blows his cover straight away, however I feel like he does better this time round, as he often manages to instantly kill one member before they have a chance to react. However, he always dies before being able to kill a second, no matter what I do. From here, I have two choices. One is to let Boris kill the member with the book and leave him for dead, or lower the difficulty so that he lives and I break one of the bonus rules. Since I don't break any rules for letting Boris die, I have to choose that over breaking the bonus rule, which means that unfortunately, I have no choice but to let Boris meet his end. Except I have one more trick up my sleeve. I decided to experiment with the save system. As I told you before, I used it in Fallout New Vegas to keep my character alive, and did the same thing at the start of this run of Oblivion. So I thought I'd try and see how it affects NPCs. In the end, what I did was let Boris kill that soldier at the start. I then saved, and would put myself in a vulnerable position so that at least one of the soldiers would be focused on me, then reload that save so I had a brief period of invincibility. I notice that the way they fight doesn't always turn out the same way, and when I load a save, sometimes one opponent would hit first, and sometimes the other. So what I would do is save on an attempt where Boris hits first, and then reload that save so that he continues to do a good job of hitting his opponents. I didn't do this for every turn, as it took too long, and I also had to focus on not getting killed. No matter what I did, it seemed like Boris would always lose to his opponent. However, on one attempt, Boris actually wins his fight and successfully manages to kill two people. Earlier, the opponent that chased me fell down to the ground level instead of taking the stairs, which caused him to take some damage. After saving and reloading the save that Boris succeeded, to my surprise, he actually manages to defeat that final member on his first try. So after a painful amount of trial and error, all three members of the Mythic Dawn get killed, the difficulty stays at the hardest level, and Boris doesn't have to die. I take the fourth volume, and once again we obviously break the bonus rule of stealing according to real life rules. I then return to Tarmina, and she tells us to wait a day and then return to her. So I leave, wait for 24 hours, then come back. She gives us an update, and we have to wait another 24 hours. She then tells us to go to Green Emperor Way by the Imperial Tower and see what happens during midday. We do this, and we get a map of Cyrodiil to appear on a gravestone with the location of the Mythic Dawn's Shrine. I make my way there and go inside a cavern, and I meet a doorkeeper who lets me in after I use the secret phrase. When I get asked for my possessions, I have to choose to either give over my possessions or blow my cover. Blowing my cover seems like the better choice. This is because if I hand them over, I have to kill them to get them back. If I give my possessions, I would get attacked anyway, as they would ask me to kill someone, and I have no choice but to avoid lying by saying I won't do that. So having my possessions on me is better so that I have more armor. In the end, I actually manage to delay when they decide to attack me, by avoiding the conversation altogether. I get the guy to come up to me, and once he comes out far enough, he starts walking back to his starting point. I stay behind him, and then when he gets close to the door, I run past him and enter through the door before he tries to react. This means that I manage to go to the next section while keeping my armor. I then quickly release the prisoner, which blows my cover, then take the Mysterium Zarxis. I have to do it in this order, because if I don't release the prisoner first, the statue collapses and kills him. Taking the book triggers the next part of the quest just fine, even though I skipped a stage earlier when I didn't talk to the guy that asked for my possessions. I then save and load that save so that I have a grace period to get out of harm's way. I then have to save and load multiple times in order to avoid getting instantly killed by someone and get to the next section alive. I do the same thing for the next section with a mix of saving and loading, and also using some skillful parkour. I then activate the lever that opens the secret exit, and take that exit to successfully escape. I give the Mysterium Zabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabzabz
agility and endurance. I want to minimize the amount I level up as much as possible, as enemies get stronger alongside me, and friendly NPCs will have a harder time against them. So if I end up taking too long to do things and have to rest on Tuesdays often, the game is going to get harder for me, as I will keep leveling up. I can continue the next part of the quest, which is to speak to Captain Bird about other spies and locating their base. He gives me authorization to search the house of the spy I previously encountered. I have to break in using a lockpick, but we have permission to do this, so we're not doing anything wrong. I then use lockpicking to get into the hidden trapdoor in her room, which leads to the basement. I accidentally went into the cavern that the next door led to, thinking that was the way to go. Then an enemy spy spotted me. I went back and found the orders that were hidden in the basement. I then leave the house, and the spy follows me, and Jorik the outcast pummels her to death like a hero. He actually got killed by her the first time round, but on the second attempt, she just stood there and took it. After her death, the quest updates again to say that I can report to Joffrey that both spies are dead, so I do so. He tells me that I can report back to Martin as he's made progress studying the book I gave him earlier. I go to speak to him, and the quest instructs me to acquire a Daedric artifact. I read a book in order to find out the location of one. This one isn't mandatory to do, which is a good thing as it requires us to give an offering to the Shrine of Azura, which is something I can't do because it breaks the first commandment. However, we then run into another problem where the majority of the artifacts require giving an offering to a Daedric Shrine. Out of the 15 possible artifacts available, only three of them don't require an offering, one of which I accidentally blocked myself off from because I had too much personality, as this one requires 20 personality or less. This leaves us with two artifacts that we can get. One is the Skeleton Key, and the other is the Spellbreaker. The Skeleton Key is one that's not a very good idea because it requires us to retrieve something for the god of that shrine, so this will also arguably break the first commandment. Spellbreaker is probably the only Daedric artifact that we can get away with taking. This is because he wants us to save some of his followers that have their souls trapped by a Daedric prince. Since we're essentially saving their lives, this is something that we would be morally obligated to do regardless of if we were asked to. So this is something that we can do for the sake of doing the right thing and not to please the false god. We also won't actually be using the artifact for ourselves when we retrieve it, so we're not letting anything from the false gods positively affect us either. However, we now have another problem. We have to be at least a level 10 to do this quest. This means that I have to completely disregard my previous statement about leveling as little as possible, because I am literally blocked off continuing the quest if I don't level up enough. This likely means that friendly NPCs would have a harder time killing enemies. Nonetheless, I proceed to load an older save from before I leveled up for the first time, and perform a well-known glitch where it involves me sleeping on that save, loading my current save, and then the level up screen appears for the save I just loaded. I can then save and rinse and repeat until I reach level 10. I end up increasing my agility, speed, and endurance with a little bit of personality. Then make my way to a shrine that belongs to a Daedra named Periite. I arrive at the shrine to find that a bunch of people are standing still and stated to be unconscious whenever I interact with them. Walking near to the shrine triggers the quest. The shrine talks to us and tells us to go to Oblivion to retrieve all their souls back. I then interact with him again so that I can be transported to Oblivion. Grabbing all the souls wasn't as hard as I anticipated. Even though there were a fair amount of enemies, there was a lot of terrain that I could use to jump on top of and make sure that I am not able to be reached by them. I collect all the souls of his followers and then return using the portal. I then talk to the shrine again and he gives me the artifact. I can then return to Martin with the Daedric artifact and continue the main quest. I give the artifact to him, then get told to talk to Joffrey. He tells me to speak to Captain Bird about an Oblivion Gate. He asks me to help him close it. I enter the gate, and this time round, I get to have the captain accompany me and two other soldiers. The captain is essential and can't die, but I also want to try and keep the other two soldiers alive. My strategy is the same as the last Oblivion Gate. Let them do the killing for me, and wait whenever there aren't any enemies nearby so that they can heal. I was surprised to find that this was actually quite easy. Since there were three of them, they were able to take out any enemies in the way quite easily. I also had to use my lockpicking skills on a door in order to reach the chamber. This was so that I could avoid looting a key off a keeper and prevent myself from breaking the bonus rule, even if it's one I've already broken before. I then run straight to the sigil stone and then leave to find that both of the soldiers are accompanying me alongside the captain, meaning that everyone survived. I report my success to Joffrey and he suggests that I gather allies to help defend from an attack by the Mythic Dawn. I decide not to do this for now, but may come back to it if I find that it's necessary in order to beat the final quest. For now, I just go to speak to Martin as instructed by Joffrey about the second item he needs for the ritual. After he speaks to me about it, 
He tells me to speak to Joffrey so that he can elaborate on it further. He tells me to go to the Shrine of Tiber Septon and retrieve his armour. I make my way to the catacombs using some parkour techniques and avoiding enemies on the way, and I enter so that I can search for the Shrine of Tiber Septon. I end up having to save and load a lot to avoid getting killed by the enemies in the catacombs. I eventually manage to find the shrine and have to remove the enchantment blocking me from entering. It is here that I realise that there are four undead blade members that I have to kill in order to dispel the enchantment, one of which I already passed. So sadly, I now have no choice at this point but to break bonus rule number five and probably the main rule number six as well, as there is no way for me to get rid of them without killing them myself, and it would be considered murder since I came to them and they didn't come to me. So this is where the challenge fails, because there's no way around this. Except, there sort of was. With the ghosts, they use magic spells that are quite slow to hit their target, and can be dodged without too much trouble, and if I lined it up just right, it would hit an enemy that was in their way. This method didn't go too far though, because I couldn't consistently circle back to the same spot, as the skeleton's attack was becoming way too hard to dodge with the ridiculous hitboxes. However, this method does become essential later. In the end, I got him to chase me fairly far, and hope that the ghosts on the way would accidentally hit him and not me. I was then planning to use the stairs and jump down the side when he comes up. It was here, however, that I made an absolutely beautiful discovery. See, just to the left of the stairs was a trap that was triggered upon being stepped on. As long as I move close enough to the stairs, the enemy will attempt to go up the stairs to try and pursue me as that's where I am the closest to hit, and I just need to simply move left when I want him to run into the trap, and then move right when I want him to back away. I did this over and over until finally the first skeleton was defeated, and I spoke to the Ghost of the Blade member which allowed me to do the next part of the quest. I then make my way back and try to find one of the other blame members while simultaneously avoiding getting killed by one of the ghost enemies. I had to save and reload quite a lot in order to get past them without dying, but that was only the beginning of this torture. I now had to lure all of the other skeletons and make them follow me all the way to where the trap was, by exploiting the save and reload glitch to its full potential in order to get that far without being killed while making sure the skeleton is still following me. In the end, I found that the best strategy was not to pull off some fancy smancy dodging techniques, but instead just move a small distance, save, reload that save, and repeat. There was one problem, however. When I went through the door to the room I came from, I saw in horror that the ghosts would follow me, but not the skeleton. So it seemed that all hope was lost. But there was a saving grace. But trust me, this tactic was not easy. But if it is possible, I have no choice but to go for it. When I went to the room the skeleton was in, I found that it was slowly attempting to walk to its starting point, and would show no awareness of me, and not attempt to attack me. This meant that I would have a much easier time trying to get the other enemies to shoot him, as I'd be able to just stand behind or in front of him whenever there were ghosts attacking me. I am also able to push him enough so that he barely moves and I can keep him in the same spot while the same enemies shoot in my direction. The damage he took, however, was so little. Eventually, he gets stuck on a rock that's in front of him. This made things easier, but it was taking so long to get the ghosts to do enough damage to kill him. I also couldn't attack him and chip away at his health and let them deal the final blow, assuming that's even allowed, because he would instantly snap out of the passive state he was in and kill me. So I had no choice but to constantly avoid the ghost's attacks and get them to hit him as much as I can. This was not about pulling off a crazy feat that required incredible technique. This was about willpower and whether or not our fellow Christian will be able to demonstrate patience and perseverance while performing the same thing over and over and over again. Again, as James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I died so many times, save and reloaded so many saves, but after a long period of time, the ghosts eventually killed him. But this was far from over, as there was still two more to deal with. The next skeleton had two ghosts nearby to it. I actually managed to do a trick, which I don't know if it will be consistent down the line, but if I bait one of the ghosts into going to the next room with me, then enter back into the previous room, save before they can enter, and reload that save, the ghost never seems to enter at all. This means I have a situation where there is just one ghost and one skeleton, which makes things so much easier. 
Damage gets dealt slower, but much more consistently, and I only ever have to worry about dodging that one ghost by just staying on the opposite side of the skeleton. So I basically spend a long time painstakingly getting the ghost to hit the skeleton while it's in its passive state, and I manage to get the ghost to kill it just before it manages to reach its starting point. I then realised that part was completely optional, and he wasn't one of the two remaining I had to kill. He was just someone that I could kill to get the key to unlock a locked door. This requires me to loot his body, so I just use my lockpicking skill to unlock a door with a lock level of hard after a few attempts, meaning that this was a complete waste of time. I then found the actual next skeleton I needed to kill, and I managed to use the same tactic as I did on the previous skeleton to kill it. I then head to the last skeleton, and I use the same trick as I did before to make sure that only one ghost enters the room. I then get him in his passive mode like the previous ones, but in this case, there's a bit of a problem where he gets aggressive quicker since his starting point is very near to the door. So I have to repeat a pattern where I leave the room once he gets aggressive and then return afterwards. The ghost tends to linger at the top or bottom of the stairs and doesn't go near the door. And the same happens when more ghosts come. This means that I can just bait the skeleton to the door, leave, then come back without having to worry too much about the ghosts going into a position that I don't want them to. Eventually, I finally managed to get the last skeleton killed without killing them myself, and I managed to do it without having to resort to recruiting a follower. I then arrive back at the room where the enchantment is, instantly save and reload so no enemies follow me in, and I am finally allowed to wait an hour and let my health recharge. The ghosts then dispel the enchantment, and I can at last go through. At long last, I managed to retrieve the armor of Tiber Septim. I leave the catacombs, run out of sight from enemies so I can fast travel, and return to Martin at Cloud Ruler Temple and give him the armor. He then tells me about the third item needed, which is a Great Welkin Stone and he tells me to travel to Miss Carcand to retrieve it. I enter that place and get to the area where I have to do a puzzle. This ended up being a pain to do because I couldn't kill any of the enemies, so I had to figure out the puzzle while constantly being chased. I managed to escape with barely any health, enter the next room, and use the save and loading trick so that they won't follow me through, and then I waited an hour to get my health back. I then manage to do the same with the next puzzle, and then heal the same way when I enter the next room. I then run past some enemies, and manage to grab the Great Welkin Stone. I then have to use my lockpicking skills to escape the King of Miss Carcand, who tries to kill me, as I otherwise have to kill him to grab the key to escape. Sadly though, since this is a very hard lock, it took me many, many attempts. Huh. That was my first try. I then manage to escape without too much trouble. Upon escaping, I make sure to save and then reload just to make sure the king doesn't follow me, as I heard there was an issue where the king would follow you everywhere and prevent you from being able to fast travel. So I did this just to make sure that this wouldn't happen. I get a safe distance away from enemies, then fast travel to Cloud Ruler Temple. I then return the stone to Martin, and he tells me we need one more item, which is a great sigil stone. He says that we need to open a great oblivion gate in order to retrieve it. Were you acting for the gods? I don't know. No! It's God! Singular! There's only one! You stupid heretic! I'm told to speak to the Countess about Martin's battle plans. She ends up agreeing to help us. I then meet her and everyone else at the chapel. She asks us if we should let the battle begin when there aren't many allies. The way I see it, the more allies we have, the more that have the potential of dying. So if I can beat this quest with less allies, there's not much reason for me not to do so. At the same time, I want to see if I can prevent Boris and Joffrey from dying, especially since I went through a lot of effort to save Boris before. Now we have a big challenge on our hands. Protecting Boris and Joffrey is optional, but keeping Martin alive is mandatory. If I do not manage to achieve it this way, I may have no choice but to gather more allies. The strategy I managed to come up with in the end was quite interesting. I discovered that the enemies that spawn in aren't always the same. The first enemies that spawn are normally a clan fear, a Dramora, and a flame Atronarch. However, one time it spawned a Dramora and two clan fears, and no flame Atronarch appeared. Since the flame Atronarchs often stand back and shoot from the distance, it takes longer for my allies to kill all the enemies because they have to run up to the flame Atronarchs. Whereas when there were two clan fears and one Dramora, they managed to kill them all before the next group spawned. I was then able to save and reload, and then wait one hour so that everyone would heal. Unfortunately, there was never another occurrence where I could wait for one hour, but I was at least able to keep saving and reloading until I got an instance where there were no flame Atronarchs that spawned. I end up doing this until the third gate opens, and with the third gate, I found that the spawns seemed to be fixed. 
so I had no choice but to just watch the remaining outcome and just hope they all survive long enough. I had quite a few attempts, and normally they would all die before we were even close to the end. But on one attempt, where there's barely anyone left, and there's some enemies chasing me all over the place, I am overjoyed to see the Great Gate appear right before my eyes, and I go in the moment it appears. I now have a time limit of 15 minutes, and I'm sadly not able to wait in this location to heal, so I now have no choice but to try and grab the Great Sigil Stone with the tiny amount of health that I have. The good news is that I'm pretty sure it's 15 minutes no matter what state you leave the enemies in. So for all we know, Martin could be completely fending for himself, and yet I still have the same amount of time regardless. If anyone other than Martin is still left alive, I believe that the more time I take to grab the stone, the less chance there is of anyone else surviving. So I basically need to move as fast as I possibly can. What I'll basically do is do a certain section after scouting out where to go, and then reloading a save and doing that part as fast as possible. I was able to easily do some parkour to skip to sections that were otherwise blocked off by a gate. The next section was a little difficult because I had to deliberately trigger the traps in front of me and move backwards in order to avoid getting killed, as just running forwards was not fast enough. I had to do this while also avoiding being killed by the enemy that was in the area. It wasn't too much trouble though, and I did it after a few attempts. I'd then run up to the top of the spiral staircase, dodge the keeper, and lockpick the door to the final room. I then run up to the Great Sigil Stone and grab it. Before I leave, I also get told that I've jumped enough so that I've become a journeyman in acrobatics. I come back to find that the only person left that's still alive is Martin, and everyone, including Boris and Joffrey, are dead. Due to me not being able to attack anyone, the fact that I'm on the hardest difficulty, and not being able to use any form of spells to heal my allies, I feel like this might have been the case regardless of how many allies I gathered. So actually having the minimum amount of allies possible is the best option in order to minimize casualties. I am open to being corrected in the comments, but I feel like due to the sheer difficulty of the situation due to the circumstances, having more allies would net the same result. So I decide to cut my losses and move on. Or, well, I almost did. See, I never thought with the level of difficulty and my limitations that there would be any way to save them. And I was right about that. Or at least, I couldn't do it by conventional means. After checking an order save, and seeing that everyone except Martin was already dead before I even entered the Great Gate, one thing I couldn't help but notice is that each gate spawns after a set amount of time, no matter how many enemies are on the field. So I had a plan. What I am about to do is a perfect example of one of the trials you may need to overcome when living your life as a Christian. As Christians, we are called to love our neighbours. However, love isn't always the thing that makes your neighbour happy. Love often requires you to make the hard choices, and those choices will often lead to people hating you. But you still do it anyway, because you know it will help those people in the long run. In this instance, in order to save everyone that I can, I need to pummel the living crap out of them. They are a lot stronger than me, and can kill me in just a few hits. So I had to use the save and reload trick, so I could make Joffrey, Boris, Captain Bird, and Martin all hostile towards me. I noticed that after I did this, the two Bruma soldiers that previously accompanied me and Captain Bird would also head in my direction, as they were following wherever he was going. I stayed on a rock to prevent myself from getting killed, and made sure that the rock was far away from the gates so that they would be lured away from where the enemies are. The only thing that had the potential to kill me was Martin's really powerful spell, but other than that, I was safe. I saw the second and third gate appear, and then eventually the enemies came up to us to attack. But by this point, there was not much time left. After roughly a minute, the giant gate appeared, and I entered it instantly. I then did the same thing I did before to get the Great Sigil Stone quickly, and then when I returned, I found that it was no longer just Martin who was still alive, but Joffrey, Boris, Captain Bird, and the two Bruma soldiers that followed him. And they then killed the two remaining enemies left without any issues. Thankfully, they were no longer hostile towards me, and I didn't even get a bounty. I meet Martin at Cloud Ruler Temple, and he opens the portal to Camaran's Paradise. He also tells me I have to kill Mankar Camaran, which obviously I can't do. Let's hope that I can find a way around this. When I enter the Paradise, I come across a man named Kathutet. He confronts me and says that I should battle him or do a service for him. I originally agree to do the service as it means we'd avoid killing. However, the service for him would require me to free someone that has tormented and been cruel to many of the people here, and he even admits he deserves the punishment, but it affects his reputation. Then, when I go to the place where he's trapped, the slaves beg me not to free him due to how cruel he has been to them. 
For this reason, I don't think it's morally right to free him. I also can't choose the battle, since if I agree, I need to avoid killing him directly, so he won't actually be battling by definition, which means I'd be guilty of lying. So I decide to just punch him square in the face and get him to chase me so I can skip the dialogue altogether. HA! TAKE THAT, CATHUTET! I lure him over to an area where there is a river and a rock sticking out over a hill. I manage to get him to take damage by jumping into the river from the rock and getting him to follow me and taking full damage. He dies after I do this three times. I then loot the bands of the Chosen from his body, again breaking one of the bonus rules. I go to the section that I need to go to and wait for an hour so that I can heal. We now have a problem. I am forced to equip the bands of the Chosen in order to open the door. Once I then enter the room, I am not able to unequip them. The bands of the Chosen have a 50% weakness to fire. Since they have magical effects, these are linked to a false god and positively affect us. There is thankfully a solution, and here, I borrow a tactic straight from the speedrunning community. I end up using a trick called Load Warping. Load Warping is a trick that allows you to spawn a profile from a different save into the location of an area that's in another save. In this case, I ended up progressing normally with the Bands of the Chosen and reached the point where I can enter the building where Mankar Cameran is. I then go to the door to enter and press A and Start at the same time. I then load a save file from before I ever equipped the Bands of the Chosen. And lo and behold, I am now inside the building where Mankar Kamaran is, and my character is in a state where they never equipped the Bands of the Chosen in the first place, as they are still in my inventory unequipped. The downside is that it means we won't have a temporary follower that would be able to help us with this section. And even though he is very weak, he does respawn and helps us again after a certain period of time. Many of you who have watched previous pacifist runs by YouTubers like Nurbit have seen that this section is probably the hardest section to complete while being a pacifist. Nurbit concluded that it was only theoretically possible, and that for him it was actually impossible, and he had to bypass it by doing a skip to the final quest. Another YouTuber called FETV actually did manage to pull it off, but he states that he doesn't fully understand how it happened. Even then, he had to use spell reflect abilities, and then other people have gotten past this section by poisoning the person as it doesn't register as a kill in the game's stats, but this would definitely be considered a kill by me. In the end, people doing regular pacifist runs have had a nearly impossible time trying to get past this section, with FETV being the only one I could find that managed to do it without meeting our definition of killing, and without skipping entirely. Since we can't use magic, since it breaks the first commandment, we can't use the spell reflect technique that he used. Not to mention we'd have to do it without the follower that normally comes with us that others had the benefit of using. If we wanted to do the skip, that would also require the use of magic, since it requires the use of scrolls. With no one managing to come up with a viable strategy that doesn't use magic, it's safe to say that this section is impossible to do without killing. Now you just hold on one second, because this isn't over just yet. For you see, there was an accidental discovery I made, which was caused specifically by the load warping trick that was necessary for the survival of our run. First things first, when I go up to Mankar Kamaran, he doesn't try to initiate a dialogue with me. Nothing actually happens until I talk to him, and then he attacks me like normal. Then, his two children didn't enter the room immediately. It was quite far into the battle that his children eventually entered. But while he's attacking me, they don't do anything. They just stand there and do nothing. Unfortunately, if I then try to attack him, again assuming that it's allowed, the quest updates to the correct stage, and they then join the fight and try to kill me. Okay, so that's all well and good, but how exactly am I supposed to kill him? Well, Mankar loves to summon Flame Atronarchs, which is precisely what ends up being his downfall. By this point, I've had plenty of practice in getting enemies to shoot other enemies that I need to get killed. Although Mankar is very strong, if I stay close to him but not too close, he will often try to initiate hand-to-hand -hand combat instead of casting deadly spells that kill me in one hit. After a while, his Flame Atronarch disappears, and he doesn't always cast a new one, but I found that if I save and then reload, there's roughly a 20-30% to 30 chance that he will spawn a new one. Later in the fight, I found some weird behaviour where his son, Raven Cameran, decides to join the fight. This has either ended up being really annoying, or quite helpful. His fighting style tends to be getting up close and hitting you with a sword, but if you are a certain distance away, he will sometimes hang back and cast some lightning spells instead. So when this happens, I would try to bait him into casting the lightning spell and hope it'll land on Mankar, then save and reload after a successful attempt and do it again. It's not so bad even if Mankar spawns a flame Atronarch, 
because both of the attacks are pretty easy to dodge. The key thing here is that I still don't have to deal with all three of them at once. If I get the scenario where he's coming after me with a sword, I would reload an older save and keep trying to run into a better spot where he would then cast spells more. This has often allowed me to get hits on Mankar quite consistently. At some point, Mankar got struck by Raven, and for some reason, Raven died. I don't fully understand what causes this, but there is something that causes damage to them. I don't know if they drain their health to gain more power, or if striking their father causes them damage. Either way, he died, then after a while respawned and was back to ignoring us. Then at some point he'd join in again. This happened quite a few times. Might be thinking that this would still be impossible because of how Mankar tends to heal when his health is low. Well, I don't know what to tell you, because for some reason, Mankar never tries to heal himself throughout the entirety of the fight. I don't know if this was something affected by the load warp, or if it's just something that happens sometimes. Either way, after a long, long time, Mankar was eventually killed by the attacks of his own allies, and we take the Amulet of Kings. I return the amulet to Martin, wait an hour to heal myself, then check the stats to confirm that I successfully managed to defeat him without killing him or anyone else. The rest was simple. I had to go to the Elder Council Chamber in the Imperial City, run straight to the Temple of the One, and try not to get killed on the way, wait an hour for Martin to arrive, and let Martin defeat Mehrunes Dagon. And with that, we managed to beat the game, and this challenge is a mission success. Plus, after the cutscene finishes, I see that both Joffrey and Boris are still alive. I'm guessing if you run to the location fast enough, you can prevent them from being killed. We also poetically finished just in time for Tuesday. So how did we do? Well, let's find out. In terms of the main rules, we successfully managed to follow every single one of them. We didn't deliberately be positively affected by anything linked to a false god, we rested for 24 hours on Tuesday, we didn't say anything that dishonored our father or mother, we didn't murder, we didn't sleep with a married person, we didn't steal by the game's logic, and we didn't lie. Let's go over the bonus rules. The first bonus rule was to not be positively affected by anything linked to a false god, even if it's accidental. We sadly failed this when we had to pick something right at the start, in terms of what god we descended from. Rule number two was don't kill. We managed to follow this successfully. Rule number three was don't steal by real life logic. There were multiple occasions where we had to loot a body where it probably would have been considered stealing by real life logic. So sadly we failed to follow this rule. Rule number four was beat the game on the hardest difficulty. We were very close to giving up on this bonus rule on multiple occasions, but we stuck to it and managed to follow this rule successfully. And the last rule was don't use non-quest related followers. Again, there were quite a few occasions where it seemed impossible to avoid this, but we managed to follow this rule successfully as well. So throughout this entire run, we only broke two bonus rules. Sadly, the bonus challenge is still a failure since I have to meet all of the bonus rules in order for it to be successful. Thankfully, despite some very, and I mean very close calls, this challenge was still a success and you can beat Oblivion without breaking the Ten Commandments. This ended up being easily my favorite challenge to do so far. I decided not to do a poll this time for which game to do next, because I knew that Oblivion was probably not going to win for at least a while. But I also knew that there were people from the Skyrim video that were asking for a run of the game, so I decided to run a game that I knew I'd enjoy playing next, as the Cyberpunk video ended up being not very fun to play at all, and I got really sick of it towards the end. This game was an absolute blast though. It felt like there were so many sections that had seemingly unsolvable problems that were able to be tackled and exploited in crazy and bizarre ways due to the weird ways in which Oblivion's mechanics work. Now don't get me wrong, there were quite a few sections that made me want to rip my hair out. But overall, I'm really glad that I got to do this video, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did enjoy it, please give the video a thumbs up, and if you want to see more stuff like this, please click that subscribe button and also hit that notification bell. If you also want to support me financially, you can choose to become a Patreon supporter, where I post updates on some animation stuff that I'm working on. It's completely optional, however. Big thank you to Haya, Ziggy, and Christopher Feemster for supporting me on my Patreon page. It really does mean the world to me. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and peace out.